Hi everyone, my name is Maria. I am a community fundraiser with Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank. And uh, this is Adam Morgan who works on our advocacy team. We're so excited that you could join us today for this virtual volunteer opportunity that Point Park's Community Engagement Department has uh, so generously partnered with us on. Uh, today we're gonna talk about a few things. First, we're going to um, explain how Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank has met the need of um, the community throughout the pandemic. Then Adam is going to lead us through an advocacy activity. Um, you should have all received a packet um, explaining um, some of the activity and what things like SNAP are and why it's important. And then lastly, we're going to talk to you about a really exciting virtual food drive um, that you can all participate in. Um, but we're just gonna get started off by pretty much showing you a video of Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank. We would normally love for everyone to be able to join us, um, but since that can't happen right now, um, I still wanted to be able to essentially show you who we are, what you do, what we do and where we're located. Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank was established in 1980. We opened our Duquesne location in 1999. The food bank serves individuals and families in 11 counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, and we work with a network of 365 agencies, partners, and programs. Here, in our Repack Center, volunteers pack food before it's distributed to our network of agencies. In a year, we welcome almost 6,000 people who volunteer. Volunteers also sort product donated through food drives from our community partners. Once the food is sorted and packed, it is stored in our warehouse. This food also comes from government agencies, farms, food distributors, retail stores, and restaurants. By 2025, our goal is to distribute 50% fresh produce. This cooler helps us store dairy, meat, fruits, and vegetables for those we serve. About half of our 365 agencies, like pantries and soup kitchens, come here to pick up their orders. They pull their trucks or vans through these garage doors to load their pre-ordered items. After the agencies have picked up their food, they take it back to their sites and distribute it to the people in need. Some pantries don't have the ability to pick up their order, so our fleet of trucks delivers their order to them. On their return to the warehouse, the drivers pick up donated product from our retail partners. Our mission is to feed people in need and mobilize our community to eliminate hunger. But we can't do it without your support. You can help us end hunger now by volunteering, making a financial contribution, and using your voice to support and strengthen programs and government policies that guarantee adequate nutrition for everyone. Learn more at pittsburghfoodbank.org. So I hope that quick video um, gave you kind of an idea of how we are currently functioning. Um, we're going to go ahead and go right into our presentation um, to tell you more about our programs and um, how we're able to accomplish um, everything that we do. Um, so like I said, um, thank you so much to the Community Engagement Department at Point Park University for um, making this connection and getting um, the whole university community involved. Um, Adam and I will be leading this discussion today. Um, and I first wanna talk about why we exist. Um, and essentially, the main reason why we exist is because not everyone in our community has quality access to food or enough to eat. One in seven individuals in our region are food insecure, meaning they lack regular access to safe and nutritious food. One in five children in our service area is food insecure. 62% of individuals served have chosen between paying for food and paying for utilities. 
32% of households report at least one member with diabetes, and 57% report at least one member with high blood pressure. So to combat all of those challenges, we have several programs um, that we run through the food bank to try and meet the needs of the community. Um, most prevalently, we have our member agencies. We have over 365 pantries and soup kitchens who are in our network that directly provide food to people in need. Uh, we cover 11 counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, so those member agencies are um, scattered across those 11 counties. We also have a variety of child nutrition programs. So, for example, we help schools get signed up for free re and reduced uh, breakfast and lunch and after school programs. We also sponsor summer feeding programs and um, help other individuals get set up for summer feeding programs. Um, our senior boxes are a federally funded program. We pack about 6,000 senior boxes for seniors in need in our warehouse every single month. Uh, so that program really helps to make sure that uh, seniors who are particularly struggling um, can have a box of shelf stable food every month to get them through. Our produce to people distributions um, were also really popular. Right now, we're not able to host produce to people because of the social distancing reg regulations. Um, normally, we would serve between six and 800 families at a particular location where everyone would receive um, up to 50 pounds of fresh produce. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing to make sure that the families who participated in that program um, are still getting services throughout the pandemic. Next is our Green Grocer program. This program is really interesting because it actually goes to areas that are considered food deserts, meaning there's not access to fresh fruits and vegetables within a certain square mileage, or there's not grocery stores within a certain square mileage. Um, and Allegheny County actually has quite a few of these. So the Green Grocer gro goes out and does a fresh food market at each of these locations, about 18 right now, once per week. This program is really interesting because it actually gets a lot of its produce from um, a farm that we partner with at Chatham University that allows us to plant any type of produce that we'd like um, so that we can provide it to our customers. We also sign up a considerable amount of individuals for SNAP each year. We have a team that can really help individuals um, when they call in or stop into the food bank to be able to sign up for this benefit, um, which was formerly known as food stamps. Adam's gonna talk a lot more about this today. Um, but this is really great because SNAP can essentially reach more people than we ever could at the food bank. Um, and so it's really important to be able to make sure that all of the families we serve um, who are eligible are able to sign up for this. And lastly, um, we have an advocacy team, which Adam is part of, who helps to ensure that we are constantly advocating for um, more just food security policies uh, within our government. And Adam's gonna be talking a little bit more about that again today. Um, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had several focus areas. Um, we have primarily been hosting large drive up uh, distributions. These distributions have really ranged in size. Um, we've gone anywhere from 300 cars to almost 1,000 car ser cars served within a two to three hour period. Um, these have really gotten the most media attention throughout the pandemic because of the long line of cars that uh, you'll see when we have a distribution. Um, I think it's really relevant to point out that these lines have always been there. They might just not have been as visible because the, you know, the cars just project such a prolific image of the need. Um, and the need has certainly increased by almost 40% throughout COVID. Um, but these drive up distributions have really helped us to combat that. 
Another program that we have created to meet uh, the needs of the community is our doorstep home delivery program. So for this program, volunteers come to the food bank to pick up between seven and 10 shares of food for families in need and bring it directly to their homes. It is a no contact distribution, so we just leave it on the front porch or the side door, anything like that. And this program is really great for individuals who might be at high risk for COVID-19, individuals who may have um, a disability that makes it hard for them to get to a pantry, um, seniors who might not qualify for our senior boxes, but also have a hard time getting to our food pantry. So this doorstep home delivery program really helps us meet the needs of some of our most vulnerable um, individuals. We also um, helped provide meals for school-aged children. We had um, hundreds of different uh, drop-off locations that families can come and get um, their free or reduced lunch, just as if their children were in school. Um, we have really ramped up our SNAP assistance to be able to make sure that the individuals who are recently um, experiencing food insecurity have assistance um, in that way. We've also been relying pretty heavily on our volunteer needs. This has been um, one interesting facet of the pandemic because we've really seen more community support than ever before. But to keep the volunteers, our staff, the families that we serve safe, we really need to function with the least amount of volunteers possible. So we've really been pivoting to have virtual volunteer experiences, virtual food drives, things like that to make sure that we can still engage with everyone. Everyone can still make an impact in their community, but we can also keep everyone safe. Um, for sourcing, this has been an interesting facet of the COVID-19 pandemic because for the first time we actually were competing with grocery stores on purchasing product, um, which has never really happened before. Um, we had lost out on some bids from grocery stores um, who were able to bid higher than us. So coming up with creative sourcing solutions, partnering directly with farmers, partnering direct directly with um, retailers was really, um, really an opportunity for us. We also have partnered with our community table partners. So these are maybe restaurants that had to close due to the pandemic um, and they had some items left over within their restaurant that would otherwise go to waste. Um, and so they brought it to the food bank so that we could appropriately distribute them. And lastly, our gleaning and produce program. Gleaning is essentially when you go to a farm and um, pick the second harvest of food. So maybe if a farmer didn't have um, the ability to hand pick things and he only used um, you know, a tractor and didn't wanna go in, he might call us up and say, um, I have all of this produce in the field. If you want it, you can have it, um, but you gotta come get it. So in those instances, we essentially send a group of volunteers and a food bank truck down to go pick that farm. And this infographic really um, just helps to visualize the amount of need that we saw throughout the pandemic. So more than 14.7 million pounds of food was delivered to the community from March 16th to June 30th amid the pandemic. Um, this included 10.7 million pounds of food to our neighbors, delivered by 365 of those partner agencies across 11 counties. So um, at our drive up distributions, we served more than 34,000 cars in just a few months. Um, 7,228 people received more than 360,000 pounds of food through our emergency food program um, at our food bank warehouse. Nearly 300,000 pounds of food was distributed through food bank partners. Over 10,000 people received nearly 300,000 pounds of food through the food bank's doorstep delivery program. Nearly 170,000 pounds of food uh, was distributed to children through our meal sites. And 839 people applied for SNAP. 
Um, and so I just want to go in and show one more video about um, how the needs of the community were really met. Um, the people that we're serving, um, a lot of the people that we're serving, about 40% right now, are individuals who have never needed our services before and um, who are really here because of job loss or um, some other circumstance that requires them to utilize our services. Um, so I'll go ahead and pull up that video. I've been out of work for over a month and I've been helping my daughters and they need food. I'm a single mother. Um, due to this quarantine, I'm not working right now. Uh, my child is home more because there's no school. And so feeding the both of us is a little bit difficult at the time. We had ran out of money because my daughter was working at the hospital. She had to stop because I have the kid, you know, I have cancer. Over 60,000 of my members laid off right now and wonder where their next meal is going to be. Um, it's heartbreaking, but it's inspiring to see so many people want to do great things. I know a lot of our members are struggling, um, and this is how we're going to make it better. If you need help, you need help. You can't feel bad about it. Everybody needs help sometime in their lives. So you have to do what you have to do to feed your families. I just appreciate the fact that I'm able to come down here no matter what time and, and be able to get you know some assistance. It just makes you see how people can come together in time of trouble be there for each other. It definitely makes me feel so grateful to be alive. I understand now why Mr. Rogers always said, look for the helpers, because it's the ones that complain and yell about how the inconvenience to themselves, whose voice is heard so often, and yet quietly thousands of others are behind the scenes doing something positive. And when you see that happen, you have to do it as well. They're very gracious and they're very appreciative. And, uh, you know, that's just what Pittsburgh does. We come together, we help each other in need. Words can't even say how beautiful that is to come together like that to want to help these people. And I know these people are very appreciative uh, for what you all put into it. The essential worker has gotten recognition during this virus. They really have. And it's been a long time coming. So we thank you, thank them, thank them from the bottom of our hearts. And that's for me and my daughter and everybody that's here. Across every industry, across neighborhood boundaries, across income, age, race, anything that we would use to divide us during this crisis, it's been the other way and people have pulled together.
So um, I hope that video gave you a little bit of insight into um, who it is that we're currently serving um, and why it's so important to serve those individuals. Like I mentioned, a lot of the individuals that we're seeing um, have used our services for the first time and there has just been such an overwhelming, unprecedented need um, to help feed people in our community. But it also has just been so inspiring to see how individuals in our community um, have come together to help and to try and ensure that their neighbors in need are food insecure. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Adam. Adam, I'll go ahead and share my screen for you to talk about um, how we can advocate to help further um, help individuals. Great. Thanks, Maria. Um, again, uh, my name is Adam. And I am the advocacy coordinator at the Food Bank. I'm part of a two-person government affairs team. And first, I just want to answer the question, why does the Food Bank need a government affairs team? Well, first and foremost, about 37% of the food that we distribute as a food bank comes from the government. It either comes through commodities uh, directly from the government or funding that they provide us that we're then able to use to purchase food and then distribute the food. So last year we did 35.5 million meals. So that means more than 13 million of those meals originated from the government. So if you know that funding of those commodities were to go away, that's a lot of meals we'd be losing. So we are constantly advocating to um, maintain those funding levels and even increase them in time of need um, or in time of increased need like we've seen with the pandemic. So as, you, as I said, 35.5 million meals we did. Last year, SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps, it provided 260 million meals in our 11 county service area. So while the work we do is incredibly important, it, it pales in comparison to the, the number of meals that uh, SNAP, the, that one governmental program can provide across the country. It is the largest and most efficient anti-hunger program in the country. It is also one of the most efficient anti-poverty programs in the country. It is essentially important. Um, and that's just one uh, you know, of the government programs that helps feed people, but there are many more, which I'll talk about, and they come um, you know, from all the different levels um, of government. So when looking at the, the political universe um, of the food bank, um, you can go to the next slide. We have, of course, the at the federal level, at the top, um, we have the president, but then legislatively, we have two senators um, for Pennsylvania. And then in our 11 county um, service area, we have the House of Representatives. The program that they are voting for or authorizing or providing funding for is SNAP, like I mentioned, the school and summer meals um, for our kids, a program called TFAP, which is the main commodity program um, that, that brings food into the food bank and allows us to um, get that out to the people we serve. And then a uh, program called CSFP, which is the senior box program that Maria mentioned earlier. At the state level, uh, we have a governor, obviously, and usually about, uh, we're usually dealing with three of the departments um, in his uh, administration. In our service area, we have 11 state senators and 47 state representatives. The two main programs uh, at that level is the State Food Purchase Program, uh, which is similar to TFAP and uh, getting us food bank food so we can get it out to the people we serve. 
and then the Pennsylvania Agricultural Surplus System that lets us uh, do a lot of those partnerships and collaborations with farmers and really um, to get as, as much fresh and nutritious produce to the people we serve as possible. Then on the local level, uh, we have 46 county commissioners or council people, and then many, many city and borough officials across those 11 counties. There's not a, a ton of programs or funding coming from the local level uh, for food. Um, the one exception being the um, community development block grant uh, that the county and uh, city governments are able to provide us a little bit of funding through those. But these officials are really helpful when we're trying to advocate to the federal or state officials. Um, they're really valuable advocates on our behalf. And then when we are trying to um, plan or coordinate local distributions in communities, they are, are very uh, helpful contacts um, in that planning as well. So the what I wanted to get everyone um, to advocate for today uh, is at the federal level, and it's all about SNAP. Again, it's the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. The Congress has passed three, I think, yeah, three uh, um, COVID response bills uh, since March, and only one of those bills did it provide any sort of boost uh, to snap so congress uh, has been uh, negotiating and debating a fourth uh, round of legislation and uh, we have been really been trying to advocate for that um, boost to snap because as i said it's the most efficient anti-hunger program in the country and one of the biggest um, anti-poverty programs uh, in the in the country so what we want to see is, is three things. We want to see SNAP increased the, uh, the maximum benefit by 15% per month. We want the minim, uh, minimum monthly benefit to nearly double from 16 to $30. And we want to suspend all proposed administrative rule changes that we saw uh, last year that would cut benefits at least until the end of the uh, health and uh, economic crisis. We are asking uh, you, everyone to focus on the Senate. Uh, the House of Representatives did pass a fourth round of legislation all the way back in, uh, I think it was May 15th. So it's been 137 days since the House passed that bill and the Senate has done nothing. Um, and in that House uh, bill, they, they, it included all three of those provisions that I just laid out. So what I'm asking all of you to, to do today uh, is to call our, our senators um, and ask them uh, to, to, to really boost SNAP um, uh, that we know it, it, that it needs. I know that uh, it can be... Uh, Maybe a little uh, scary or, or daunting to um, call an elected official's office and try to to talk to them or their their office about um, you know these policy issues. So I recommend just keeping it simple. I gave you three things we'd like to see um, uh, done to the SNAP program, but you know if if you are a little nervous, keep it simple. Just focus on on one of those items. If you're just going to focus on one, I recommend focusing on the top line item, and that's increasing the monthly maximum benefits by 15%. In the previous bills that Congress passed, uh, only the one, the Families First Act, it did provide emergency SNAP benefits um, for households that were on SNAP, but it only provided for boosting all households up to the maximum level, um, the, the maximum monthly allotment. What it didn't do was provide any additional funding for the families that, are all, that were already receiving the maximum amount. And the families that were already receiving the maximum amount are the poorest or most low-income families that are on SNAP. 
So those most in need weren't provided any additional benefits. So that's why I'm recommending you focus on that one issue because the 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 poorest, the most needy families um, out there really need that help, and they haven't um, been provided uh, any additional help with SNAP yet. So we have two senators, uh, you know, federal senators from Pennsylvania. Uh, the, their names and the contact information uh, on the on the slide. Um, just having done this a while and knowing both senators uh, somewhat well, at least knowing um, the policies they prioritize, I can say that Senator Casey uh, has historically been in favor of boosting SNAP or protecting SNAP. Um, so it's not going to be a hard sell uh, with his office. So if you if you call his office, you can say something like, um, you know, I just wanted to thank Senator Casey for the leadership uh, that he's uh, provided on these anti-hunger issues and really just want to encourage him to continue making SNAP a priority and keeping the issue front and center. Our other Pennsylvania senator is Senator Pat Toomey. Uh, and again, historically speaking, he has not been uh, generally been in favor of boosting SNAP or protecting SNAP. Um, when the administration was trying to cut it last year. So uh, if you call his office or even email his office, you can say something like, I really urge Senator Toomey to boost SNAP to help all those families struggling um, to make ends meet because they lost their jobs or because their children um, are not getting uh, enough food um, because they're not going to school as much as they used to or they're in a hybrid model, so they're not in school every day. Also, SNAP is a really, really beneficial to local um, businesses and economies um, when the people um, are spending their SNAP benefits in their stores. So SNAP is a proven tool to help those local businesses as well as those food and secure families. And again, you, can, you see their um, their office numbers uh, on the screen, or if you want to go to their website and uh, send them an email. Um, when, if you do call, uh, you know, you can ask for the staff member who usually handles hunger issues, or more likely whoever answers the phone is just going to take the message. They may ask for your uh, address. Um, this is simply to, one, um, confirm that you're a constituent or a Pennsylvania resident, but also so they can follow up with you and provide you a written response um, based on the senator's you know, platform and public policy um, positions. So um, with that, I just want to you know, thank you all um, for, you know, for, for doing this and for prioritizing um, anti-hunger, um, especially in the age of uh, COVID-19. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you, Adam, so much for that. Um, and I do want to remind everyone that Adam has put together a packet with written out examples that everyone can use to either um, call these representatives or email them. I know particularly with my University 101 course that I teach, um, we um, all had to email what these senators and we did get emails back, which was really exciting for us. Um, so it definitely is effective and I highly encourage you all to participate. But I also want to take a moment to talk about um, another way that we can help to solve food insecurity in our communities. And that is through um, raising dollars for um, people in need and for the food bank to be able to purchase food. Um, so with every $1 donation, the food bank can provide up to five meals for people in need, which is really, really um, just impactful for the people that we serve. Um, and dollars actually go a lot, lot like a lot farther than if you were to just go to the grocery store and purchase food. 
On the left, you can see if you went to this grocery store and spent $10, um, all of the food that you would be able to donate to the food bank versus if you gave us $10 um, and we used our purchasing power and our connections, um, we're able to also provide up to 50 nutritious meals, including fresh produce, protein and dairy, um, things like that for our neighbors facing hunger, um, which we can't necessarily do through a food drive for a variety of reasons. Um, food drives, we can only accept shelf stable items to ensure that we are um, meeting food safety standards and that we don't get give anyone um, anything that might go bad. But with our um, purchasing power, because we purchase so much um, through the food bank, we can actually help provide those nutritious meals. Um, so just again, for every $1, we can help provide up to five meals for uh, people in need in our community, which um, just makes a world of difference for us. So we went ahead and made Point Park their very own fundraising platform. Um, so if you visit pittsburghfoodbank.org slash PPU, um, you're able to donate and share the campaign on social media. Um, if anyone is looking to donate, that's really wonderful, but we also know that you are all students um, and so that your resources may look a little different. Um, but one of the best ways to really raise awareness about the work that we're doing um, is to share on social media so that people can see our resources. If people would like to donate, um, they could certainly do so through this link. Um, so if you are interested, it would be really wonderful to share to see if anyone in your network might be interested in getting involved. And with that, I just wanted to um, give some of our contact information. Again, my name is Maria um, and I'm a community fundraiser with the, Pit the Pittsburgh Food Bank. Um, Adam Morgan joined us today. Um, he works on a our advocacy team. And then I also just wanted to um, give the contact information for Kelly Wilding, who works in the community engagement department um, and helped organize this. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm happy to answer them. And um, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting everyone involved. And I hope that we can see each other in person soon. Thanks so much.